Yeah, so I will, I will begin by um, welcoming Sven Kesselring to our um, seminar series. And this is the third of a wonderful group of uh, seminars talking about mobility pioneers. And um, we, we start usually, Sven, by just introducing ourselves, just going around, and then I will introduce you, and then you, you can start the presentation, um, if that's all right with you. Is that okay Thanks. with everybody? Yeah. Okay, so um, Anita, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so my name's Anita Perkins. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Otago in Dunedin. Um, I've spent a little bit of time in um, Bavaria, so <laughs> it's cool to um, have that connection. Um, I recently put out a book on um, German travel writing and mobilities, and I'm really interested to learn more about your work today. Okay. You want me to say something now? Yeah, okay. Um, well, my, my name is Sven, Sven Kessling. Um I'm a sociologist. Um, I worked in the, um, um, well, I started actually my career in, it's in, in the research center on reflexive modernization. Um, so risk society theory and um, in that um, research center um, I worked there from 1999 to 2007. Um, we made a project which was called the Mobility Pioneers about structural change in mobility in modern societies. Um, and this is actually also what I'm, what I'm going to talk about that. So my, my career after that went a little bit more into um, oh, straightforward actually into interdisciplinary context. So um, I worked for a couple of years at the Technic University in, um, in, the, in, a, in a center um, in, well, organized around mobility and transport and transportation engineering. I was teaching in a master program called Transportation Systems. And then I went to, to, to Denmark and had a professorship there in um, mobility governance um, and planning, um, which was more, um, it was part of the planning department. And, and so I <clears throat> worked on these links between social sciences, planning studies, engineering studies. Um, in, in, in that sense. Um, and right now I got a professorship, which is actually the official title is actually um, Automobile Industry um, Sustainable Mobilities, um, which is um, based in a small university with about five and a half thousand students um, in the south of Germany. Uh, between Stuttgart and Munich, I would say. Um, and um, it's, it's a university which is dedicated to sustainable mobility as a whole um, in, in all different, different um, um, parts of the university. And um, in March, we're going to start a new master program, which is called Sustainable Mobilities, um, which is an experiment in many ways because um, it, is, um, it is based in the context of automobile research um, or, or automobile industry um, basic, basically um, but it opens up to many modes of transport to many ways of mobilities actually <clears throat> and it's um, the experiment is also to bring in the mobilities approach into an education um, in Germany so it's the first master program on um, this kind of approach in Germany um, so I'm quite excited how this is going to work and um, and um, my research is actually um, very much focused around mobility work. Um, so I did also a lot of projects on corporate mobility on, um, yeah, that's the title also of my talk today, um, about how people are actually getting around with a high mobility pressure um, in professional contexts and how they actually connect different forms of mobilities, um, physical mobilities, virtual mobilities, basically, um, and um, how they actually handle different cultural expectations or needs to, to manage different cultural contexts in, in their work. Um, so this, this is um, a line of work that I actually follow up since quite a long time, um, about 20 years now. Um, what c came in is, um, and it's it's going to be a little bit part of the of the lecture today. Is is also, um, for example, we made uh, recently a couple of weeks ago 
actually two weeks ago, um, a conference which was called Sharing Mobilities and how um, new concepts of sharing mobility, um, basically also car sharing, ride sharing, bike sharing, so different forms of also sharing places, Airbnb and all these issues, um, are changing our understanding of um, how we can organize, how can we manage, and how can we access um, and even share mobility in, in modern societies. Um, then I would say I'm just going to go right into, into the, the lecture. Um, what, I, what I want to do is, um, I'm, um, well, I'm not talking very detailed about the empirical results from, from the Mobility Pioneers project, because that's actually um, I, I old empirical. A lot of things have changed, um, as we all know. Um, when we started in 1999, um, people actually were asking, virtual mobility what is that um this is kind of a stupid thing we you, you try to talk about that and um we all know if we mention the word um, virtual mobility or digital mobility um it has a quite different connotation today um <clears throat> and um if anita is, is there um the whole writing about mobility has changed a lot and um all these questions of connecting places um it's it's a totally different story than it was 1999 when <clears throat> we not only made research on mobility pioneers in some ways this project was kind of pioneering um, because there was almost no social science literature um, when we started the project John Uri's book um, from 2000 um, mobility um, beyond um, how, how's it called um, societies beyond um, no, help me. Um, John Harris' book from 2000 <laughs> wasn't out at this time. So it was, um, it came, um, it dropped, so, so to say, um, why we've yeah. been trying to, to develop a kind of theoretical framework for that project. Yeah. So um, what's the problem in search of reflexive mobilities? That's, that's one part I'm trying to talk about. Um, and then a little bit about what are the, the phenomena we, we actually talk um, about when we, when we mention the word mobility pioneers. And then um, the, for me, it's the, um, the, the corporate or the company as a, a kind of entity um, in organizing and structuring mobilities is quite an important um, construction, and that's the reason why I'm talking about corporate mobility re regimes. And last but not least, does corporate mobility have a future? So I'm trying to, to come to um, the questions of sustainability. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna be that broad as I actually have it in the lecture, because um, I think we, we agreed for about 40 minutes. So I'm trying to talk until, um, in my, my schedule, nine o'clock, and um, then we can actually start discussing the things. Um, okay, um, in search of reflexive mobilities, um, structural change in, in, in the mobile rich society. I think there is a, um, there is a kind of an underlying or maybe also overarching hypothesis in, in, in the whole research on mobility pioneers, and that is that we are actually witnessing um, a sort of fu fundamental change um, in, in the organization of mobility, which is basically connected to, um, let's say, digital nomads, net surfers, mobile workers, all these different connections of mobility, um, of physical mobility or place-bound mobility and, um, and non-place-bound mobility. So the, the, the connection between um, what we call also mobility um, beyond the time-space continuum, um, which is getting more and more inscribed into everyday life. And it gets like a sort of taken for granted feature in the organization of um, private um, and intimate relationships. Um, it's getting more and more inscribed and, and routinized in, um, in work relationships. Um, so we are not talking about like a totally perfect concept of or totally perfect infrastructure of that. But, um, but it's, it, um, well, let's say if, if like a company like IKEA is, is actually putting out uh, one of the key slogans for the, 
for their mobility uh, management, uh, meet more, travel less. It also tells a story about that there is an infrastructure, there are actually features that can be used to organize um, these, these working relations about um, across time and space um, without traveling that much. But um, the idea of mobility is actually very much um, connected on, on the one hand side um, conceptually um, on, on freedom and autonomy and um, the freedom to move and um, also the um, what I would call the the Humboldt idea of going out to in, into the world, experiencing the world, tasting the world, touching the world somewhere else, and and like embodying a sort of experience with the with the the uh, with foreign places, um, with strangeness, with the other, and and so forth. So I think it's. Um, and this is the reason why we made this extremely complicated um, table um, about like just just to sort out and, and like finding a heuristic model of understanding that there is a significant change in modern societies, um, which is also like, I would say, materializing in mobility practice somehow. So if we, if we start with the, I'm not going to talk about all this in detail, but um, traditional mobility was very much, um, it, if we go back to the 11th century, um, these traders going out from, from Venice um, and, and finding new spices and, and setting up these this travel connections. This is all the stuff that actually Marx describes as a fundamental feature of modern capitalism. Um, and up to um, what, what Scott Lash today is, is calling the third modernity. So I need to say I'm still in the second modernity, but I'm trying to, to, to integrate actually the discussions about the third modernity, which is basically um, a sort of mediatized um, modernity, um, where exactly these things are actually um, in, in the center that I was mentioning new ways of organizing social relations across time and space or as we call it, beyond the time-space continuum. Um, I, um, I mentioned this, 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 this conference that we made on, on sharing mobilities, and one of the like, inspirations for us was actually um, Jeremy Rifkin's work um, on the um, Zero Marginal Cost Society. And I think he has this very, very illustrative and very clear description of this, what I call the structural change um, from, a, um, from a society in, in the 19th century, which was based on steam powered printing and the telegraph and um, coal powered rail and factory systems to society um, in the 21st century where the internet is becoming the communication medium for managing distributed renewable energies and automated logistics and transport in an increasingly connected global commons. So I think um, even if we, if we don't take um, the, the discussion about the global commons in the center, um, what he actually describes there is, is a new form of, um, of organizing mobility um, by bringing in automatic logistics and, and, and new forms of physical, the, the organization of physical mobility and basically the Internet of Things as, um, as, as a sort of infrastructure, um, a, a backbone of, of um, second or third modern societies um, that is actually enabling new social relations or social is keeping social relations also um, across time and space and I think the whole discussion about sustainable mobility and I'm going to pick up on this this later is um, is um, also I would say it's not centered but it, it plays an increasingly important role um, if these new organizations of time and space can also open up strategies or possibilities for, for sustainability pol policies in the future. Um, John Erie um, says that, um, or he said um, that, that in, in his 2000 book, um, I consider how the development of, of various networks and flows undermines indigenous social structures. And I think this is a, this is a perspective, and in that sense, even if, if Ulrich Beck, as the, the author of The Risk Society and John Erie are, in many ways quite different um, or have been quite different um, 
in, in their thinking and also their theoretical um, outreach and their theoretical um, concept in the background. But one idea is actually quite in common. And um, Beck formulated that in, in this way. He said, nobody can escape the global. This is because um, the global, for example, the, the cosmopolitanized um, re reality isn't just out there, but constitutes everybody's strategic lived reality. Even immobile be people are cosmopolitanized. Um, people who have never left their villages, let alone ever boarded a plane, are still closely and commonly linked with the world in a way or the other, in one way or the other. Um, they are affected by global risks. And they are linked with the world, not least because the mobile phone has become to be an integral part of the everyday across the, the globe. Um, he actually, he, he formulated a little bit, bit straightforward um, in that formulation. He said, we are living in a world that is not just changing, it is metamorphosing. This implies radical transformation in which the old certainties of modern society are falling away and something quite new is emerging. Um, it is quite interesting that the whole discussion about like the substitution of physical travel through um, communication or what I would call um, virtual mobility, um, it has very long um, been discussed in a way um, that the empirical data actually tells a, a different story. So if people are, for example, working from home instead of going to the office, um, they actually um, have the opportunity to travel more around, circulating around the home instead of commuting to the workplace. But in all in all, so like it's um, a lot of the research says either it's a, it's a zero sum game or it's um, even increasing um, physical travel um, because people actually do more activities around, um, around their home. But on the other side, um, I think there is also a lot of research that actually says today that um, in companies there is a new infrastructure um, that can be used um, for the replacement of physical travel through um, communication that is not like used um, in its full potential. And I think this is, this is the point actually when we think about this, these transformations that um, if there's also a generation effect, younger people, when they are actually, they are, they are growing into a society where it is totally no, normal or completely normal to sit at home and to have a chat with their friend in Dubai or somewhere else, um, seen from a European co um, context that's really far away and, um, and it's not really the common thing. But um, that's, that's um, when I see my daughter is actually, she is developing social strong social um, bonds and st strong social relationships to people somewhere else in the world so what i want to say with that is that um this this metamorphosing of the of the uh, like um the social and the communicative and the cultural infrastructures that are actually going on it's not basically the technological infrastructures they are like they have to be there, but the question is how are they used and how they are interpreted and how they are getting like inscribed in everyday routines and embodied into, into um, the organization of everyday life. This is changing fundamentally and we actually, we are like, that's what I said at the beginning, we are kind of witnessing a process where we actually don't know where it's gonna end in. in. And we all know that, um, um, social life is extremely um, creative and it's extremely also adaptable on changing conditions. Um, so when actually in we gonna live in a world in the future where um, these, let's say the, the sustainable development goals, even when Trump is now the, the president of the US, gonna be something that, that actually policies will be rewritten and restructured in a way that these two, two degrees of, of increase um, will be taken for serious. Um, the legislation and also the, the, the regula regulative um, framework of societies is gonna change in the future. So who says that there is not like a, maybe it's not a linear, uh, a linear development, um, and this is actually basically what we can learn from the theory of reflexive modernization, the risk society. A lot of these developments are not linear, 
they are just cumulative and at some points they're going to speed up in, in, in a way. So um, I'm not sure if Ulrich would be agreeing with that sort of interpretation of his metamorphosis so because he has, of course, different empirical cases in mind. But it's also not um, a coincidence that Ulrich has, in his last book about the metamorphosis, he has a chapter on, on mobility and transport. And um, one of the, 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 the sociologists, um, Stefan Lessenich in Germany, who is kind of influential right now, he actually has also a big chapter on mobility. So I think the, the whole question about um, the transformation of modern societies into a world <clears throat> of sustainability and, and mobility justice, in a way, um, is something that we should be very careful in, in monitoring these, these, these developments and be aware that at some point um, the, uh, the organization of time and space can actually, like what Uri would say, tip into a new formation, a new constellation, a new configuration, as nobody else would say. Um, this is actually very strongly the background of the of the the theoretical background or the I would say the driving idea behind um, researching on mobility pioneers. Um, it also has to do with the fact that um, the idea of of doing research on pioneers, um, so people who are actually exploring new fields, exploring new practices, exploring, um, using new technologies in a way. It also comes from the, from, from the fact that um, a lot of inno innovation um, actually comes not from, from the mainstream, but um, the whole transition theory, for example, is actually focusing on niches. Um, so what is happening in the niches, what is happening in, um, like, I would say what kind of social innovation is actually happening in places where we don't expect it. So this was the, the reason why we looked into this, but um, driven by, um, I would say, like a bigger, bigger question that it's not only about um, like tinkerers going into new uses of technologies or redefining technologies, but that there is a new understanding of um, positioning identity, positioning um, people in time and space and also um, writing their, their story in a specific way based on, on changing infrastructures. Um, what, <coughs> what is actually one of the, um, uh, or the, the, the models that we've been using is that we can actually, um, this, this, this idea of mobility and immobility is actually blurring. It's not an either or it's not the one are mobile and the other ones are immobile or that you have to make a decision between different different um, states of, of mobility and immobility but that um, we actually get more and more um, what we call ambivalent types of um, organizing time and space so that people are um, for example highly <coughs> physically um, corporeal uh, Lee, um, highly mobile, traveling a lot, but in their social context, they are actually quite um, immobile or quite fixed in, in the organization of that. So that patterns are actually emerging from that. I'm talking about this a little bit more later, um, which are centered around um, a very small group of people like family and a couple of friends, for example. Um, but um, this gives them the opportunity to be extremely mobile, traveling a lot, um, because they have this kind of fixed point in their life that is giving them the, the opportunity to travel or to organize that, that sort of mobility. So there is um, a high physical mobility, but a low degree of social mobility or cultural mobility. But you, on the other side, you have <coughs> people who are like connected in, or they are part of very complex, very interactive and very far flung social um, and virtual networks. So they are like part of, they might be one of a hub, like a hub in one of these networks, 
but they are actually don't travel a lot. And this was the, um, I would say, the, the strategy, the empirical or the methodological strategy, the search strategy in that project that we actually tried to find these extreme cases from which we can actually learn something about maybe emerging, emerging patterns um, that are coming up. And um, I said that before the project started in 1999, that's um, quite a while ago now. And um, from seen from today, we can actually see that a lot of these patterns that we actually found in, in a very early stage um, in this, this, I would say, kind of sometimes really nerdy people who are, have been trying out things and um, that they are actually quite... Um, I wouldn't say normal, but they are more and more spreading into everyday life. So um, maybe one kind of small episode about this empirical work. Um, I made an interview with, with somebody who was actually um, not traveling a lot. And, 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 and he was actually, he was organizing a, um, a um, very, very big mailing list on, on German literature um, in, in, in Munich. And then, um, then he talked about that he sometimes he goes to the cinema and after that in, he was, he was, um, that was in, in 2000 that I made this interview, um, which is now 16 years ago. And, um, and he talked in a very illustrative and a very, very clear way that he, after he goes to the cinema, he talks to people, his friends about the movie. And, and I had this very clear picture that they are sitting somewhere in a pub and they are discussing about the, about the movie. But then I figured out um, quite at the end of the interview, actually, um, that he was talking about chatting with people in Los Angeles and San Francisco and, 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 and Sydney and, and somewhere else. So um, he, he was in, in this early phase talking about something that I had no empirical or not, not no experiences in my own life. Um, so he, it was like, okay, this is something that happens. Um, this is something that is, is going on because these people were his closest friends. And um, this is just a, a small episode um, about the, the power of that, that kind of, of, of research that you can figure out um, you can never say if this is going to be a strong pattern in the future, but you can actually say it has the potential to grow into a strong, strong pattern in the future. Um, in that sense, um, researching on mobility pioneers is always um, a sort of future research in, in some sense. And maybe you can only make use um, later of, of that work um, because you can actually trace it back to the early beginnings of a pattern like this um, 10, 15, maybe 20 years later um, and you can actually help to understand how these things are actually growing into society. Um, I just want to want to show you that picture because I like the title "Progress in Immobility." It's basically it's about it's um, traffic control research um, about um, how to improve traffic flows. But I think uh, all along this um, this discursive frame that suddenly immobility becomes something that is sort of positive has a positive connotation. Um, and that Siemens is putting that on on the on the cover of um, of its um, magaz magazine um, tells actually quite interesting story um, where actually sociologists sociologists have a lot of fun of giving that some sort of meaning and interpretation. Um, there is some things going on, and this is this is maybe the underlying the second underlying hypothesis. Um, not only that we can actually um, well, this is maybe the German, the German tradition in my work. Um, not only that we can find the boxes for it and we can put up a, a chart or a table which is actually saying, okay, there is. We can, we can actually um, conceptualize um, a structural change, but, um, but also that there is seriously something going on in society. Um, the the um, Part of my research is actually to understand how actually global, I would say, um, 
the global scale as a, as, a, as a labor market or the global scale as a place where people are actually working is, is coming up. And um, on a global scale, um, the estimated um, population of so-called mobile workers, that is by definition actually people who spend at least um, 10 hours per week outside of their working place or their home. Um, so they have to travel at least um, 25 percent of their working time is actually estimated to 1.3 billion um, and that equals 37 percent of the total workforce. Um, this is a, a forecast that is going to be redone every, I don't know, every three or four years. Um, so I think the next one should actually come out in 2016 and I expect it to be growing from 1.3 um, to I don't know I'm, I'm I'm not mentioning any figures but I think it's it's a growing um, um, phenomenon I would say um, in the Americas region estimated growth from 183 million mobile workers in 2010 to 212 million in 2015. And what I found interesting is the um, the Europe Foundation found out in 2015 that in Europe. A, a common um, phenomenon. Can, can you hear me? Because it says that the connection is un unstable. Can you hear me? You just went, um, you kind of broke up for a while there. Are you okay, Anita, hearing? Okay. Yeah, I can hear and, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. How about Maria and Anita? How are you? Yes, they're both okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, you've come back, back. So I think it's okay. all right. Just for a little bit. Yeah, just broke up a bit, but yeah. we're okay. Um, that's that's the, the the level of the corporate mobility regimes. Um, but I think it's um, what where we can also see that um, that something is is happening in um, what I mentioned before that maybe a younger generation is more moving into a different concept of mobility, where also automobility as the the key um, like artifact or the, the automobile as as the key artifact is losing its meaning and losing its um, structuring power um, and influence on everyday lives um, <clears throat> that we can probably see in, in data like this that um, when 3,000 millennial consumers born between 1981 and 2000 were asked which of 31 brands they preferred, not a single car made it in the top 10, which mainly consists of internet companies like Google. Um, I think um, we can also see that in the um, in, in in the figures when are younger people actually um, making their driver's license? Um, so it's it moves slowly to an older age than they don't do it at, at the age of seventeen or eighteen or maybe in some some countries at the age of sixteen. But they maybe they wait until they are nineteen, twenty, twenty one, um, and there are other priorities um, that come before um, the car. Um, all these things about car sharing. So um, I would say one of the fundamental actually changes in the concept of mobility is actually the whole discussion and also even the, the introduction in the future of um, automatic driving. Um, so it completely breaks with the idea of um, automobility in, in the sense of self-mobility or individual mobility. Um, a, of control over um, the uh, the life course and all the the, the geography uh, um, around the individual, so it's 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 a different different where the uh, the transitions from using different modes of transport, I would say, from cars to public transport to the internet actually becomes. Um, um, at least an option and, and like like it has the same value it has the same um, I wouldn't say meaning but it, it's um, um, what Max Weber would have said it's it's a disenchantment of, mm -hmm. of automobility that is actually happening there and which is actually also um, coming into into the organization of fleets in, in companies and so, so I would say the the, the transitions um, from a 
physically a geographically bound concept of mobility into mm. a um, more digital, virtual, um, metaphorical understanding of what mobility actually is, is already happening. Um, it's happening like sub-politically and it's, sub it's some, some ways all unseen, um, but there is something serious going on. Mm. Um, corporate mobility, so I'm actually, that's what I said, I'm not sure if I still going to be able to say a lot about sustainable mobility at the end, but um, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm talking 10 more minutes now. Okay. Um, the corporate mobility is machine. I think it is, um, if we want to understand how mobility works, um, maybe this is a little bit bit too pronounced, but, but I would say we have to look into the organization of companies. Um, we have to look into the organization of business life. We have to look into the organization of professional um, social relations, how they are structured through and by mobility. And um, this is maybe this, this chart um, or this gives an overview um, on the key, key findings of um, the Mobility Pioneers project. Um, another really good painter, so these, these pictures are, they should be more sophisticated, and, um, but, um, but I think they, they show the, the key message of that, that research. Um, we never said anything about quantitative um, spread of this, the center of mobility management is, is so many percent and this, but um, it is what I said that um, these, these patterns, some of them, particularly the last one, the network mobility management was in a very early phase. Um, we could actually identify that. But um, right now we are thinking about setting up a new research on that, like a follow-up study on this. And I'm pretty sure um, the third pattern of network mobility management is going to be much stronger than it was in 1999 or 2005 or 2006. Um, so these, these three... <clears throat> three patterns and we had a lot of discussions about what is the status of these three patterns is this kind of ontological um, structurations of time and space or what is it I would say it's it's a heuristic model and um, a lot of the empirical research that we did after that um, we actually could relate directly or or sometimes less direct but but nevertheless we could relate to these three patterns of organizing social relations and geographical relations there is the one pattern i already men mentioned the so-called centric mobility management um, where the power of that pattern actually comes from a very clearly centered what we call stability core um, of social belonging and social and also geographical fixities. Um, in, at this time, we found this pattern as, as a very strong gendered pattern. So um, it also has to do with the, with the sample that we had, that we, um, we had serious problems to find a lot of women traveling a lot in, in companies or in um, context of freelance journalism, for example. Um, so it was very often it was the case that the, the men in the, that pattern traveled a lot, but the women they actually took over more this 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 role of, of guaranteeing the stability in, in in these relationships. And I think we what we what we actually one of the the lessons learned from that is actually that. Um, if we would do that kind of research in the future, we would actually always make interviews with couples um, because this kind of everyday organization of mobility plays a quite important role. Um, the second pattern, um, this decentered mobility management, um, I, there is this what, what comes in now, this, this multi-locality. And I, I mentioned this figure from the Eurofound Foundation that um, about 30% of all people, um, working people are organizing their um, their working life between different places, um, and especially in the in the context of freelancers, um, we made um, in the project about 130 interviews with different groups, different different professions. But one of the the bigger groups in that sample was actually freelance journalists, and in that um, like 
these networks of freelance journalists, the decentered mobility patterns that people had different places where they organized um, their everyday life um, was actually quite strong amongst these, these journalists. Um, so this is a multi-locality or Beck was always talking about plural locality. Um, um, Robert Nadler wrote a very interesting paper about plug and play specialities. So the the, the mobility expertise or the mobility competence um, to to uproot and relocate and um, to uproot at some places, um, but also to keep social relations to the place you actually leave, leave or um, to keep um, complex networks of different places alive and maintain these, these social networks around these, these patterns. Um, this was actually quite quite strong in in that pattern, and um, it was that part of the of the sample where we've learned a lot, um, the most about mobility competence and what it needs to be able to to organize a mobile life, um, because these people actually travel a lot. Um, the network mobility management. This was actually this this sort of overlaying of um, physical or geographical networks and and digital or, or virtual networks um, at this time um, where the internet even in this is this early phase of the internet was um, the the infrastructure or the backbone of organizing a mobile life and um, so one example from that from that um, from that sample which what I actually use used a lot is um, I made an interview with an, with an um, with a journalist who lived on the Balearic Islands and he worked in Germany and he had relations to Russia and to the US. Um, so what he did is that he actually put up um, his calendar on the, on the internet, um, which enabled other people to connect to him in places because they knew when I'm traveling to that place or in, in two weeks or in two months, he's gonna be there. Um, then I'm gonna meet him and I make an appointment. It had this role or this function of um, well, organizing jobs because people could actually see he's gonna stay two weeks in a place. I can book him for an afternoon or I can book him for, for a day. Um, <clears throat> but very much it was also the, the, the opportunity for his friends and, and relatives and, and also um, uh, other people he just knew um, to connect to him and to to meet meet um, somebody like like lives a life as a moving target um, around the world. Um, so these are the three patterns that actually played a key role in 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 the mobility pioneers project. And this was one of the first things where we thought, okay, um, the whole talk about virtual mobility um, and the digitalization of, of um, social relationships um, or the digitalization in, in, in particular um, is something which is kind of intervening into the organization structure of, of, of uh, private lives very much. This was a journalist, a freelance journalist that I asked, um, what, are, what is the most important place in your life? Because we had this, this um, ego-centered social network maps, but we also had this so ego-centered geographical maps that we've been using. And the question of, for, for this chart was actually, or for this, this map was, um, what is the most important places in your life? Please put in the most important in the center of that, of that map and the less important um, more to the outside of the, of, the, of the map. And the first thing she wrote in was my email, my, well, my email program, my PC, my house, my desk. Um, and this was the first time that I saw that was one of the first interviews I think we, we did that at the end of 1999 or 2000, uh, where I thought, okay, there is something serious going on and um, we should actually follow up on this, this um, in, in some ways. Um, and then the, um, the, next, the next question was actually, I asked what, what are more important places and then he, she came up with these three websites, um, which are not only key for the organization of her professional life because this is the website she distributed her work um, through. Um, 
And then it took a while until she came up with some physical places, like the place where she was born, the university where she studied. And as you can see, um, the place of residence actually plays a quite marginal role, in, in fact, in, in, in this map. Um, so this is a social sp spatial pattern of network mobility management. Um, the the organization and this is this is also one of the key findings of that um, that we we well we followed this this Gittins approach of of the duality of actor and structure. Um, so we looked on how people are actually organizing their their lives, and this is what we try to symbolize with these 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 three patterns that we can find three strategies or three patterns of of managing. Um, um, well, uh, demands of being mobile, um, of high mobility pressure, in fact, in, in, in many of these, these professional lives. But we also looked on um, the discourses, the corporate discourses on, um, of how, um, well, what are the main discursive strategies or what are the main the main the, the key frames of, of how to organize um, mobility within companies and the one thing is that a very strong force comes actually from this normalization of mobility um, even if we talk to people who only work for a year or a year and a half in a, in a, in a highly mobile job they've been talking about this as it's, it's always been part of their reality it's always been their life has always been mobile um, even if we had the proof that we could see, okay, they've never been working in a mobile job before. Um, they've been always been working in stationary jobs before. Then um, the individualization of mobility. So mobility and the, the management of mobility and uh, also the, the coping of the, um, of the problems, the social problems, the health problems, the... Um, um, the cultural problems around um, a, li a mobile life becomes an individual task. So um, the institution of the company is actually very much withdrawing from that responsibility. And um, we made these projects for, um, for a foundation from um, the German trade unions. And we needed to talk a lot and to convince the trade unions that they have to go into that field of... Um, supporting actually the mobility competence of mobile workers in, in the future. And right now they are actually setting up a lot of um, like education programs around these things. So they are actually reacting on this um, and mobile work. Um, that's different to, to the time when we started on that, that, that research is today one of the big issues in Germany, actually. It's, it's a huge topic um, on every different level. Um, um, from federal um, research fundings to um, trade unions to the companies, the HR departments, they are actually kind of sensitized for these things. Um, then the whole thing about rationalization. Um, the rationalization of, of mobility, corporate mobility, is, is an extremely strong um, phenomenon. It's an extremely strong um, process that is actually happening right now. Cost reductions, the optimization and standardization, um, who can fly first class, from when can you fly first class, how many hours do you have to fly, and so forth. And um, the whole discussion about time space compression. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to dig deep into it. Now you're scared because you can see that um, pattern um, or this, this, this table. I'm not going to talk about the details, but um, I just wanted to show you that how we get these things together, um, that we have these, these um, three patterns, the centered mobilities, the decentered and the network mobilities, which is actually referring to the idea of, um, of this, this fundamental change in, in modern societies. And then these, these four key discourses, the normalization, rationalization, the individualization, and time-space compression. And uh, I need to say I have a couple of more slides, but I would say um, maybe we should just enter the discussion from there. Um, uh, because um, what I try to say is that um, 
that I think that social sciences right now, they actually have this, this task or um, this challenge of, um, of doing some kind of decent research on these, on these changes and also take it for serious that um, digital mobility or virtual mobility um, might play a key role in the, in the organization of sustainable mobility in the future. I would say I'm going to leave it here. Great, great. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> There's lots. Uh, yeah, shall we clap? Yes, thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. You went through a lot of material in a very short amount of time and starting with the traders and then ending up here with, yeah, that's fantastic. And I love this last slide where we can see the uh, three patterns that came out of the 1997 to 2006 project. And you've also brought in the corporate discourses and um, had some examples. It just looks fantastic. I think that'll keep us talking about it for months and months. It's just fantastic. Um, but this is, this is definitely work in progress. So it's, it's not like the, the last answer on these, these patterns. It's just one first attempt to bring these things together. Yeah. Um, yeah. It looks really, it looks like a great first attempt. It looks really well thought through and um, yeah. Well, let's, let's have some discussion because I think we have about 10, uh, 10 or 20 minutes with Sven. So um, shall we open it to discussion? Would either of you like to make a comment or a reflection or a question? Yeah. Um. Sven, thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting and I'm sort of probably a little bit uh, all over the place with my thinking about this. For me, the, the instant thought always is somehow, how does this refer to, how does any of this link in with, um, with mobilities or discourses of mobilities that are not European and that are not rich? And I mean, of course, the last uh, couple of things that you looked at are about rich people's mobilities. But before, uh, and especially when you looked at the centered, decent, networked uh, mobilities and looked at pioneers and um, those sort of globalized mobilities and those sort of things that you introduced at the beginning, there is a chance to 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 bring this into a sort of wider global context but then you kind of shifted into cosmopolitan uh, cosmopolitanism of rich people and um and this corporate kind of thing so where where would you see some kind of engagement with those that are outside the rich world yeah well i would say first um point taken um because no no <laughs> I, i'm not criticizing you know, i'm just asking it's, curious it's, it's that's not, not yeah. a problem but but i think yes. this is um we have this discussion actually for quite a long time and i can remember when we started in the research center there was always the critique that this is a euro-centered um rich country sociology um, um which comes actually from munich um in, with mm. the special conditions mm. um i think this is just just a fact, and this is the way where it comes from. But, um, but if we look, for example, into what is happening in Germany right now, um, yes. with the war in Syria, for, let's just yeah. keep to that, that example. This is not the whole word because the Syria is actually quite close, but it's, uh, it is, it's, in some ways it's a proof case for that. And I think um, a lot of these, when we, for example, take this pattern of the decentralized mobility management, this is actually something that fits very perfectly for, um, I would say, a mixture of the decentralized and the network mobility management. Because um, if, we, if we analyze how people from Syria actually came to Germany and how they made their ways um, through Europe um, to Germany, um, new technologies actually played a quite, quite important role. Um, and I think the... Also, these um, going away from your, your country where you grew up and keeping the relations to other places or to, to that place. Um, so I think that technology actually comes in, in quite a lot. Um, and I would say that um, what is missing in, in that, that kind of research is just to look into 
how it looks in in different um, levels of income. How does it look um, in 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 groups of people who have different resources, um, who are actually in crisis, for example, and who are actually um, threatened um, in a way. So from like ecological disasters or um, or um, war and and all these things. And I would say. Um, we haven't done that research, but I, will, I can see actually a quite strong potential with working with these three patterns in explaining how people are actually um, moving around and how they can actually, and this is, this is actually, it's the, it's the theoretical main, one of the main pillars in that research, how they can actually deal with uncertainties, how can they deal with insecurities and risks. So in that sense, I would say there is a potential for that, but um, but right now I need to admit um, we don't have, in parts we have the research because we made a project with um, people working in the construction industry um, in in the lower income income levels and how they organize um, mobility. Yes, yeah, very interesting, and I'd be really curious to see where you would be going if, if you would decide to go a little bit further. And again, I agree with you. I think that it will be very interesting, especially right in front of the doors of Munich, to look into, into some of those issues in the context of Syrian refugees or other, other refugees as well. Um, I do know of at least one project uh, of a student uh, who is currently sitting in Italy. Uh, she's investigating mobile mm -hmm. phone use and um, like gaining information through the internet and, in, and to what degree does that help mm -hmm. uh, moving forward or, or settling depending on what the decision is. So that would be very interesting to see and I also am interested in the construction worker um, research that you're doing there. So yeah, great. Thanks for that response. And just to follow up on that comment, um, the, the, we've had very interesting groups of people come and leave New Zealand after our earthquakes. And so the idea that construction workers are now forming a corporatized flow is very interesting because they get brought in and um, basically government bailouts to regional authorities and local authorities um, is helping to pay for them as much as um, as uh, you know the work being given to local companies but so you have to factor that in that the corporate citizen isn't necessarily an, an office worker anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just to follow on from that um, before you came online we were talking a little bit about this kind of idea um, in Wellington in the capital city here in New Zealand, we recently had a pretty big earthquake and it um, just brings about new forms of where people are working. So for government workers who normally work in the CBD, the whole city was closed down for one or two days. And at the moment I'm working at a place where it's a temporary office because the building is not safe. And in this temporary place, there are some people who prefer to work from home and some people who have moved from having permanent desks to having what they call hot desks. So all of these new kinds of mobilities and I thought of two things as you were talking that related to this kind of experience. Um, one was sort of this breaking down between the workplace and the personal maybe when you're you know, talking about this guy who's got his calendar who he's using for both work and for catching up socially and how when we were having updates about whether it was safe to go to work or not, people the workplace was making a Facebook site because that's actually the quickest way to get to information. Um, even though it's your personal Facebook site that often you like might only have certain people who are your good friends outside of work as your work friend, but that kind of stuff tends to break down. And then there's been a lot of emphasis on well-being as well. So some people are really upset and can't really cope with the changes from the normal practice of, this is home and I go to work and I have my desk that I'm familiar with and then I go home because they're having to take new routes or they're having to have meetings at people's houses or use their own personal computers for doing work. So I thought that idea of the work of sociologists and helping to bring around um, competency in mobility 
maybe not only for people who are mobile workers by choice, but also people who are forced into this position or um, as a result of natural disaster or those kind of things. Um, I'm not sure if there's a specific question in there, but those are just some of the reflections I had while you were talking from my own recent experience. Well, I, I think this, this is a very interesting, interesting topic. Um, what I would call like, um, what happens with the organization of mobility if there is a, what, what maybe what, what could be called a disruptive um, event. Um, so there, when, when the ash clouds um, on Iceland was, um, I don't remember, it was 2010, I think it was, um, there, there was actually also a lot of publications after that that actually showed that um, on the one hand side, um, on the organization of um, on the company side, not a lot of things have been failing or um, so because there was this infrastructure that is actually um, it's, it was guaranteeing that work could be done um, even if people couldn't fly. Um, I think um, like an earthquake is actually it's kind of interfering into into um, all sorts of routines, all sorts of take it for granted um, um, like parts of, of of professional life and private life and it it, it forces people. Um, to, to adopt to a situation where they had n absolutely no influence and they, they haven't seen it coming. And I think it's, it's actually, um, well, I would say it, it could be actually quite interesting research um, building on this to look into it, um, how these processes of, of restructuring actually work and what are the, maybe also the, the opportunities to rearrange things and to, to restructure things and um, how, what happens with the social relationships and what happens with solidarity in, in, in societies or in places. So what kind of, of like um, new forms of um, helping each other are actually coming up and what kind of strategies people actually develop in a situation like that centered around the, organ the, the question that um, the relation between home and, and work has to be kind of organized and has to be structured in a way. So I think there, um, it, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking about if that's, that's morally actually acceptable to, to, to learn from a situation like that about uh, resilience and, and, but it has, it has a lot to do with resilience and, and um, how people actually are able to, um, to position themselves to each other in, in, in a situation like that. Um, and I know that's um, why Monica Bishop, for example, she does a lot of research on, on these, these things and how these like helping structure. And we had, Monica was there for the conference on sharing mobilities last week or two weeks ago. And we had um, a very interesting discussion about um, what is actually the old fashioned, I, I, I don't think it's old fashioned, but it's um, sometimes it, it, it feels a little bit on old-fashioned um, term of solidarity in, in a situation like that. So what are the new forms of solidarity which may be not only based on face-to-face, on -face, um, like the old concept of, of solidarity actually was? Um, it seems there's somebody new coming in. Is that no. Melanie? Oh, okay. Uh, Melanie is just checking, I think, uh, because she was organizing the meeting. Can I budge in there, Sven? I, I think this is really interesting, specifically with this whole North Dakota pipeline. I, I know everybody probably mentions it, but uh, with this whole North Dakota pipeline situation, old fashioned solidarity seems to be pretty much out there right now, isn't it? Yeah. Like, um, I, I need to in say combination I with social media solidarity, virtual solidarity, or, or those sort of things, right? Yeah. Is I need to admit, I, I haven't investigated this, this North Dakota yeah. thing. Um, yeah, so. and I just talked, I talked to a friend in Germany actually this morning and hear that none of it is in the German newspapers or anywhere in the media. It's unbelievable. It is all over here in New Zealand and like okay. a lot of stuff is happening, like Māori going there to support these people and so on. 
Yes, but anyway, I just I'm I, I really what Mimi, Mimi was mentioning it last last week, and I thought I need to investigate that a little bit. What what is is behind that? But I'm I, I'm, yeah. I'm really in it. So that's... yes, but do you want to tell us a little bit about how the Cosmopolitan Conference, how that conference uh, was like? Um, was there something very specific that you were, um, you know, that you were very happy about, like? Well, I think it's it. It was a it, it was a really good good um, conference. Um, yes, I imagine it would have been. We were so envious we couldn't come. <laughs> yeah. We would have loved to have you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think it it was uh, the the interesting thing was that mm. we um, we had a lot of people actually who were specifically interested in these new sharing schemes like car sharing, bike sharing, ride sharing, and uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but as Cosmobilities Conference are, that, that's part of the concept is, um, the first day was actually quite, I would say quite um, general and very, very, very open in, in, in the perspective. Um, Bridget Wessel was talking about virtual mobility in, in a very interesting way. By the way, we're gonna put up the, the keynotes um, soon. Awesome, yeah. Um, unfortunately, Bridget, the recording is not very well, but, um, but uh, Philip Rode and, um, and Tim Cresswell's, the, the quality is actually quite good. Um, so oh, you can right. actually participate a little bit in that, in that conference. Um, I think um, what we actually came, what was one of the outcomes of the conference is actually that, um, that I think we shouldn't give up on that topic of sharing mobilities too early. So um, I'm, I need to say I'm not very satisfied with this, this structure that we have. We have a conference and next year the next conference has a different topic. Um, so um, what I would like to think about is how can we organize um, kind of sustainability in, in a topic like this because I would say sharing mobilities that's not a temporary phenomenon or it's not one of these like fashions that are just coming up and then they are um, disappearing again. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the topic of sharing mobilities and um, also sharing the access to mobility and um, also sharing um, infrastructures of mobility is, is something that is going to gonna, um, be with us for the next couple of years. And um, so in that sense, I, um, we are discussing right now if we organize a sort of follow up on this, maybe not as a conference, but maybe as a smaller workshop. Mm -hmm. um, we will have a publication, at least, at least one publication, which is going to be a special issue in applied mobilities. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also discussing uh, making a book out of it, um, maybe together with some PhD students, or not maybe either together with some PhD students or the PhD students going to do it together mm -hmm. with a book. <laughs> so, because I think we should actually... We, we should share that conference with, with more people. So, um, yeah, in, right. Mm. Yeah. And the, we had this, this memorial session for John Ari, which was actually quite touching, I need to say. It was, um, yeah. it was quite intense. Um, uh, that was, was really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for, for sharing a little bit about that. And it's exciting to hear that you're going to follow up with another one next year. Will that be again in next, December, or are you going to plan to? No, the next, next conference will be together with T2M and Lancaster. It's, yeah. it's it takes place in Lancaster. Um, mm. I think we're going to come up with the with the call um, during the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, and it will be also in November. Yeah. I think around the tenth of November. It's it's the conference. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I have another question, if that's right. <laughs> Um, I just noticing more and more personally anyway that um, the way that things are changing as you're saying the way that technology and organizing social relationships all the time most without you noticing the, like the way that we're doing the seminar series on this amazing zoom app 
or the way that the, I've started watching television by using Netflix rather than watching the traditional TV where it's fixed and you don't get to choose apart from changing channels. Um, and the way that you listen to music on Spotify gradually more than iTunes and all these kind of different things that you don't even hardly notice that you're changing, but it's actually at quite a rapid rate. And I wondered whether with the different people that you were interviewing, whether they kind of reflected on a consciousness of how technology was changing and enabling them to do these different ways of mobile management in their work, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I, I think this displays an enormous role. And I think it's, um, if, if you go back in, into the historical work on, on mobility, I think the, the most important thing, um, even if you go back to um, the telegraph, um, the, the most important thing with um, communication tools or devices was always uh, to keep in touch. So you are traveling, but you actually, you, you, you keep the link home. Um, you, you, you travel with a link home. And, and this is actually, in, in some sense, I would say Netflix or um, Spotify or um, Google Play or whatever um, one of these streaming services is called, um, gives you a little bit of home even if you are away. Because you um, even this, this function that, that you can actually download the, the albums or um, the songs that you want to listen to, um, it gives you um, this this kind of well using earplugs and um, you are in your own bubble. So you have your own individual space and you you travel with your individual space and you can watch the movies that you want to want to uh, watch if you're lucky in in the language that you actually prefer. Um, you have the, the music that you have. You have the, all these like pictures on on your on your mobile phone. So I think this this gives. I would say it it all comes back to this this thing: how to deal with uncertainty, how to deal with insecurity. Um, so it's like maybe this is the the most ontological um, thing in 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 mobility is that um, you always have to to to, to find solutions for this and. Um, uh, in some ways, this is like a constant, constant issue from the early traders in the 11th century um, up to today, um, or maybe even earlier, or definitely for sure earlier than, than the 11th century. It's always been the question in mobility um, how you can actually um, give yourself a little bit of home, even if you are traveling somewhere. Um, so and technology makes it so much easier. I need to say um, you can. Well, I would say the maybe the most important um, change in mobility was the 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 opportunity to use um, FaceTime or to use Skype wherever you are, um, and uh, it's all about managing insecurity. Even if we know that. Um, well, if you if you have a relationship and um, if you are start fighting on on Skype, it's not fun. So it's so much better if you fight face to face, <laughs> and it's so much easier to solve problems. Um, and uh, this this virtual communication also generates a lot of misunderstandings. Mm. So we can't replace everything. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you a question, Sven, to follow that up on about the word management? Because you said, um, you know, perhaps this is the most ontological question or aspect of the whole um, idea of moving away while trying to keep linked to, to home is that it's uh, that we all must find ways to manage this insecurity. And I um, noticed that you use the term mobility management. But um, I would have a, a, a lot of trouble with that, given that um, public health has, anyway, we see, we see discourses of management being personalized and um, people being responsibilized through the neoliberal um, uh, uh, ideologies that we all must become more able to manage ourselves and to manage everything from our health to our exercise to our body shape. And... Um, and I'm, I'm quite wary of the term management and even that we manage things. I think 
um, decades, and perhaps this is you know part of the moving through from centered to decentered to networked. But decades ago, our family and close friends would have um, supported us to do what we needed to do, whether it was finding a mate or you know getting further education. And I'm only thinking of generations. You know, my my parents' parents and those sorts of examples at the moment. This isn't empirical, but you know, one one trusted people around in the family unit to support whatever areas one was insecure in, you know, and and yet now, as we live further apart from each other or from formative places such as um, important workplaces we once had or something like that or, or formative relationships, we are called upon more and more to manage ourselves. And that is something that mobilities, mobilities have produced and you're picking it up as a, as a strategy, uh, you know, that people must learn to manage mobility. Unions must help workers learn to manage new mobilities. And yet management can have a really um, stratifying effect. It can have a, um, uh, it can be coercive. It can be, you know, the, what capitalism does to workers. And where I've seen it used is in you in the US in terms of um, transportation planners talking about managed mobility management being important for people with disabilities and people who can't uh, people older people and so they're a group to be um, organized but they're not allowed you know the sort of individualization that you're talking about through the patterns and so when we take up the word mobility management at the corporate level you know we might want to distinguish between whether that is still within the control of the individual or whether it's a, in, within their perceived control because, you know, fast capitalism is actually all about profit. It's not about helping people come to grips with whether they can manage the pressures, you know, and step out of the, the business or not or change their lifestyle, etc. And um, at the other end of things, uh, managed mobility for people with disabilities doesn't always solve anything. It might pro provide kneeling buses, but the bus systems may be so um, circular and uh, centralized that they don't reach all the neighborhoods or they might only take people from their neighborhood to the clinic and back. And, you know, so there's always problems when you introduce a management as a tool or a style because it, it does stratify and it fixes patterns and routines that may not suit individual needs. So I just wondered if you've thought about that in terms of your research. Well, I think the, um, the, the using the term mobility management um, has like an ironic and also critical implication. Um, ironic because the term mobility management is actually very much um, connected um, to a all sorts of fleet management of travel management within companies so that's actually the where it comes from um, so and i wanted to i wanted to get away from this this um psychological understanding of coping um so that was the reason why i actually I used it to support that yeah but it, it has a sign of, um, it also produced a lot of misunderstandings on that side because of a lot of people were actually reading that expecting me to write about um, mobility management within companies even in particular because I have this, this connection between the company level and mobility management and they've been very disappointed um, that I'm not writing about fleet management. And, and <laughs> exactly. Asset, well, asset management. <laughs> Every asset worker being an asset. asset. Yeah, exactly. They say, yeah, but, but this is, but you have no idea what you're actually writing. I said, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm just not using it in that, in that way, how you are using it. And the other thing is that um, picking up on this management perspective has, um, has this critical implication because it refers actually to Poldonsky and, and Chapello's work um, on the spirit of new capitalism. Um, that we are actually, um, we have, we have this, um, in, in Germany there is, there's a very, very influential work that has, uh, it was one paper they wrote originally that was called The Entrepreneurs of the Own Working Force. So we are all getting entrepreneurs of our own working force um, and this is what I, I mentioned that before that the 
that the company actually withdraws from the responsibility of providing good working conditions. Yes, good. Putting it on top of the individual as an, an additional task, you have to take care of your own working conditions. And I think this is, I, I need to say, I, I find this quite perverted. Um, what is happening there and all these discussions about lean management and all these these things and um, indirect regulation and, and the whole debate in the sociology of work actually plays into um, the using of that term mobility management that it's it's basically it's a critique of that and that I think institutions have to take over responsibility for these working right. conditions right. that's mm -hmm. the reason why we address the trade unions which are in Germany quite strong in that in that um, field um, as like actors and and and, and players in, in in providing good working conditions and providing good work, um, which is one of the slogans of the German trade unions that they are standing for good work. Great, great, thank you. I think you are thinking about the same things I am. It's really good to. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's sometimes it gets lost because people just read the first the first layer of that. Um, but in, actually, it is a critique of the understanding that the the individual manages itself um, in these processes. I, I, I don't know whether it's actually um, whether that's a good um, thing to bring in but for example like in, in the context of, of my work on seafarers um, I'm not so sure whether this network mobility management does include very high levels of individualization of and specifically when it comes to decision making there is that component somewhere in there because because people are being taken out of their sort of um, actual island family community networks but when they're on ships they're not necessarily completely out of it and um, many of the decisions that are being made are being made by people at home and being communicated to people on the ships and uh, and since the email system has reached many of the ships in these days some of that uh, family community decision making <laughs> pattern has come back onto the ship so people are actually in a more complicated situation than they were before there was email. And so in some way that's almost contradictive to some of these ideas of this uh, network mobility management. Anyway, it's maybe probably, it's maybe not very helpful to bring that up, but. Um, no, I think it's a great point, Maria, yeah. It, it, it definitely is a, is a great point. Um, the, the only question is how, how do you, do you understand individualization? Individualization as the like moving out of the individual of all these social relations. Um, but I would say it's it's always it's always networks that are moving. So what is traveling is is the is the network. So you never, in particular, um, I think if we talk about the network mobility management, um, in the old days you probably you have. You, you, you locked off when you left home and you locked in when you came back. Um, maybe there was a phone call in between, but actually um, part of this, this individualization today is that you need to manage that, that um, you are traveling somewhere in the middle of the ocean and um, your, your partner wants to make a decision about is the son or the daughter going to that school or to this school. Um, so this can easily happen in, in, in these modern times we are actually in, um, where GPS technologies and all this stuff is available actually on, on these um, container ships, ships for example. Um, so they, they never lock off um, completely. And I think this is, this is actually, um, well, Bauman would say this, this is actually, this is one of the challenges we have to manage that we are, we are, we, we are supposed to be individual but we actually never will be. Um, so in, in that sense, Latour is, uh, we've never been modern. Um, we've never been first modern. We've never been second. We've never been third modern. We are always on the way to, um, in, in that sense. And um, we, we, we can't lock off from family relations. We can't lock off from social networks. And um, so this is more the case. And um, I think this is, um, it's more the 
individual in relations that's the topic um, it's not the individual as such that's the reason why i said if we would do a follow-up study on on the mobility pioneers we would definitely go through a couple interviews or maybe the best would actually be to talk with the whole family at least um, or to reconstruct the social networks and talk to people within the social network because sometimes friends are more important than family members yeah. okay well i'm i'm looking at my watch and i'm wondering if um how everyone's doing are, do you have any more comments anita or maria i'm wondering if we should give our last our final comments well to me i think this is really a uh, really motivating <laughs> inspiring conversation sven so thank you so very much for uh, making that possible and I, I reckon we could at least have more conversation for a half hour but I'm also very really happy to finish it's like what is the time 20 to 10 here right now so it's probably a good idea to to um, to move to move on and look forward to seeing you again hopefully not in too far future yeah well also thank you very much I think I I'm what I'm taking out of the conversation is that I have a couple of them what we would say a couple of nuts to crack um, <laughs> or, um, mm -hmm. things to think about i think um your point about um this kind of it's it's not the first time that i that that i can see that but this eurocentric perspective that actually mm -hmm. is part of that work and um i think it's um i in, in an article that i wrote for sociologica a couple of i think two or three years ago I tried to open it up for the first time actually into more into migration and and um, these issues but it's it's still an an, an open process and um, I'm actually also not sure if I can handle it within that position that I have right now because um, other things are actually more in the foreground but um, but I think this is theoretically actually one of the challenges that I can see um, to open that concept um, to, uh, well, I, I don't think it has to be global, but actually um, I'm, it's more like that we actually, in that sense, it's, it's a global perspective that is needed to have in that because we don't have to write about all the whole world, but um, the world is there and, and how these things are interconnected. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. So Sven, I mean, and I can totally understand that you are, your focus is like this, and it's it's just for me, it's just interesting to to look into. So have you thought of those things? I also really like the idea that you might have you might have a PhD student or somebody who would look into refugee related issues. And one of the things that is interesting about uh, that area is that there is a great deal of immobility involved, and there are overlaps of immobilities and mobilities within. Uh, refugee circles which are really interesting and and it is yeah it would be a nice phd project I reckon. <laughs> or two or three yeah absolutely yeah. yeah well i reckon you should jointly um supervise some maria and sven i think yeah. you should get some german new zealand connections because clearly absolutely. they've been there in the past as anita has told us and uh, we need to start to build that again yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I do speak German, so it wouldn't be totally impossible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you yeah. see so how that works between the universities. But yeah. There you go. Are you originally from, from Germany, Maria? Uh, yes, I'm from Cologne originally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm in New Zealand almost 20 years now, but yeah. <laughs> okay. I can't hear you. That <laughs> <laughs> Well, come and see us. We have to get some money to get you over. I think that would be really fun. We'll have to figure something out. That's yeah, I'm like. seriously thinking of coming to that next conference. And if you say it's in November, it's probably, it might be even doable. And this is good timing because my uh, performance review is in January. So um, that's okay. the time when we have to say what kind of money we need. Oh, so good. If I do receive some kind of information about that, it would be fantastic because I'd love to. I'd love to come to one of those conferences. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think we, yeah. we we have a Skype meeting next mm -hmm. week. I think um, still before the winter break here in in, in Europe. Um, and I think we we're going to fix the title of the conference, and um, we also 
come out with a, with a call for papers early in January. So oh, that's, fantastic. Yeah, that's, great. Yeah, yeah, that would be excellent yeah. timing. And it's going to be Monica. Monica is involved ah. into it here, and um, she's actually the, mm. the main organizer in Lancaster. And then there's T2M, this transport historians mm. um, organization, association, and Cosmobility. So these three. Fantastic. Three yeah. Together. Yeah. Fabulous. And you know, Sven, uh, Anita has been involved in the T2M. She did a summer school in Germany. So. Oh, yeah. So was it the one involved. in Berlin? Yeah, Berlin was. Have you met in Berlin? Um, I'm trying to remember. Okay. I can't remember. I think I've never seen you there, yeah. I was there, um, it's a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think 2012, yeah. maybe? Yeah. Yeah. We need to get you back up there, Anita, to Germany. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I would say the place where my university is is not the most metropolitan place in the world, but um, <laughs> if you need a hub, um, you're, you're always welcome. So we have space and facilities. And, oh, so. Thank you. That's very generous. And I, I really like your approach and, and, and working on the, on the travel literature. And um, I'm looking forward to, to read this. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It's a great compliment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I can learn something about German literature and mobility. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I guess if I had a final thing to say, it would just be thanks very much again, Sven, for this amazing talk. That's really quite going. And again, thank you to Martha for organizing this series of really interesting talks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for very having welcome. me. Yes. Good. Thank you. Yeah. It was very fruitful for me. And Excellent. I'm going to take out a lot from the conversations. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. And let us know when you're in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think um, Anthony was there for the conference in, in, in Germany and he is traveling. Maybe he's still traveling this week, but I'm pretty sure he's going to come up um, maybe next week or the week after. No, probably not the week after because that's Christmas, but. Um, but um, pretty soon because they want to plan this for next year. And um, the idea was just to go in maybe late August or September for one week to Adelaide. And um, I would also like to include a week of, of holidays somewhere. Yeah. And also you might want to link in with David Bissell because he's been quite instrumental in um, doing the OSMOB, you know, the Australian Mobilities Network. He will be in Boston. I don't know. You're not a geographer, but there will be a big geography conference in Boston. Yeah, I will be there. I think. Yeah. So there will be, I think there's a great deal of mobilities related papers uh, happening recently in the geography network. So. So David is uh, based in Canberra. I'm not really a very keen lover of Canberra, but he's great. <laughs> He'll be worthwhile yeah. visiting on your way between different places or so. And mm. yeah, maybe I'd, I'd rather go to Wollongong to to meet. <laughs> um, but but um, Anthony and I we are planning to to uh, to apply for we applied this year for a project in, in Germany. And um, we want to apply for an ARC project next year. Mm -hmm. And um, David and Thomas, they will be part of that project. Too. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I think this, this collaboration is actually, mm -hmm. it's forming up. Um, and, um, and the AAG in Boston is actually also, uh, we have two um, sessions with Monica about um, methods. Mm -hmm. So um, we actually want to, we are working on a handbook on, on mobile methods. So Monica and Marlene Freundahl from, from Copenhagen and me. And, um, and we also have two applied mobility sessions on the AAG. So David is, is organizing one um, and Kevin and Marlene and I, we are organizing the other one. So Oh, fantastic. Yeah, well, that's, that's really good. Yeah. So you will hopefully meet... Yeah, you will hopefully meet uh, Gail Adams Hutchins, and uh, she uh, sent us uh, an email uh, about a week ago, Tara Duncan and I, and she are working on a special issue for the New Zealand geographer. And, um, and so Gail is so excited she will be in uh, David and uh, what's the name? And Andrew's session, Andrew Murray Gorman. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so 
and I'm really hoping that you will have a chance to talk to her. She's fantastic. She does, at the moment, her project is on Shea Milkers, and I think that's what she's going to present uh, in okay. Boston as well. So please watch out for her. She's so <laughs> such a lovely colleague and really... Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to be there definitely. So that's... Good, yeah. Okay. okay. So thank you. Shall we just clap? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll give a, we'll give have a, a lovely day. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>